We're going to talk a little bit about having the bladder removed and what developments there are around different forms of dealing with the urine, not all diversions. Just to remind you, the reason we're taking a bladder out uh, is usually cancer. There are other reasons occasionally, and there are many different types. Uh, transitional cancer being the commonest, but some less common ones, squamous cancer, adenocarcinoma, sarcomas, and at the bottom, salvage. Some people have their bladders removed because it's damaged for other reasons, radiation or even benign cases. But in the end, if you haven't got a bladder, the urine needs to go somewhere. Uh, it's a major operation in itself, removing the bladder. But if you have that done, you also need to have a second operation at the same time to arrange uh, some way for the urine to get out of the body safely uh, and conveniently. Um, I just put this one up to remind me that radical cystectomy is said to be the standard local treatment for bladder cancer, the bladder removal, cystoprostatectomy with the prostate in men, uh, or cystectomy, bladder removal plus removal of the uterus and ovaries in women usually although it is sometimes possible to do less radical forms of bladder removal in some selected tumors and retain uh, the prostate even uh, in men and the uterus in women in selected cases. But also if you're seeing a surgeon about treatment, there are some cases that may have the option of being treated with a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy rather than surgery. There are, in many areas of medicine, there is more than one option. You just need to make sure they are discussed in the pros and cons are put forward. So while cystectomy uh, is a, uh, a great treatment for bladder cancer and other conditions, there are sometimes other options which also have their pros and cons. Cystectomy, when I trained 30 years ago, was a major, still is a major operation, but it was a very major operation with as many as one in 10 people actually dying of the results of the surgery. Things have changed a lot over the last 30 years. And that's probably less due to the surgery than things like better modern anesthesia, better perioperative care, uh, but also some uh, advanced in surgery, smaller incisions for open surgery and minimal invasive treatment, robotic surgery, for example, and enhanced recovery and understanding what makes people get better quicker rather than just letting nature take its course. So the picture has changed from one where it's a fairly brutal operation probably back in the 80s to one where it's still big surgery, but it's uh, often more controllable and uh, with a smoother recovery than perhaps there may have been in the past. Not to say that it still doesn't involve a fair proportion of people having, uh, uh, having um, obviously a hard time during their recovery. Just put this up to remind myself, when you have your bladder out, there are some issues. That it's well known in bladder cancer, people wait too long for treatment often. There are, scans to be done, TURBTs, redos. It's often some months before the decision is taken to do a cystectomy and that's been shown to be detrimental to uh, outcome in some more aggressive cancers. So uh, uh, if a, a decision sometimes should be made earlier rather than later, if you've got the more aggressive forms of cancer, it's very clear that if you wait uh, a few months or even a year or two from the initial diagnosis uh, for treatment, your, the outcome in terms of cure tends to be less good uh, should you have your lymph nodes removed? Well, probably it's, a, it's good to do that in uh, transitional cancer, although proving a very big in, in improvement in survival by doing that is difficult. Uh, should you have, I'll come on to this in a minute, a, a, a stoma or should your bladder be replaced or reconstructed? And that's horses, of course, that really depends on you sometimes, what your priorities are. We'll discuss that in a minute. But there are options apart from a stoma, there are options for reconstruction. And uh, should we be looking at better ways of recovery around major surgery? Well, enhanced recovery, many big centers. We started this back in the, my unit in the UK in 2005. We're probably the first in the world to be doing it routinely with this operation. Uh, it's a method of making sure that all the bits that delay recovery are, are addressed to try and get through some of the complications and potential pitfalls of surgery and try and predict them and try and avoid them if possible. It isn't always, but you can try and reduce those risks if possible. So what do you do if your bladder is removed? Well, these are the actual options, they're fourfold. You should either have an ideal conduit, some form of uh, stoma in other words. Uh, more rarely a consonant cutaneous diversion. Again, rarely you can use the rectum and the zygmoid to divert the urine so you pee through your rear end. Or probably more frequently you can have a new bladder made which is then sewn onto your urethra 
usually some uh, bowel and you can try and uh, reproduce the normal situation passing your urine through your own urethra. So the first and the last one are the commonest used by far, the two in the middle being for very specific and limited indications. So just to review this, this is what an ideal conduit is. I don't know if any of you have got one, but it's essentially taking a piece of small bowel. The length of the bowel part depends on how big your abdominal wall is, but it's usually maybe 10 to 20 centimeters. Uh, you isolate it from the mainstream of the intestine. You take the uh, ureters from either kidney. And in various ways, you sew them to one end of the small bowel and you bring the other end out of the skin as a stoma. And the urine freely passes down the ureters into the conduit and then out to the skin. And then you form a stoma that sits proud of the skin and wear a bag over it. And this leaks um, urine into the bag uh, day and night and hopefully is controlled by the bag. And as anybody who has one knows, they do change over months and years. The shape changes. The, uh, there can be some skin issues. Uh, but with the help usually of specialist nurse support, ideally, um, people come to a way of living with them. Um, and um, it's probably by far, certainly even in a specialist unit, I've worked in the UK, probably 60 to 70 percent of people who had their bladder removes had, had this form of uh, method of dealing with their urine. And it's probably the commonest worldwide. So the ideal stoma, the ideal conduit. Any questions so far? Or? Just quickly, the two rarer uh, forms. You can nothing, no, you're no, you're no, uh, no, sorry. more often. It seems like a good thing to do. Uh, it used to, it's quite common in developing countries. It's also quite common at one point in Germany. Um, you can take do basically you put the ureters into uh, the rectum or sigmoid colon, and you can augment this or make this larger by putting another piece of bowel on the front of it, uh, and you pass urine through your rectum by sitting down, mixed with feces. It is quite effective. The, there are ways of making pouches. This is just a, a pouch where you actually form the, 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 the large bowel uh, into a pouch. You put the ureters into the back of it, so the urine collects in the pouch, and then you sit down and get rid of it by peeing through your rear end. Now, I've, I've used this a few times in my life, usually where there's no alternative. Um, and sometimes when I worked briefly in East Africa in the uh, years ago, we used it quite often then. Um, the one of the problems can be leakage of urine at night uh, into the bed when you can't fully control your anal sphincter. And there's a, also a small risk of cancers forming when the feces and urine are in, uh, are in um, communication or near to each other. So it is a good thing in selective areas. And some people find this a very good way of dealing with their urine, but uh, it's one that probably most surgeons won't even discuss with you, but can be there if there's an issue if you don't really want a stoma and a new bladder is impossible, there's a small number of people who go for this version of, of, of diversion of urine. You can have a constant cutaneous diversion where you make a pouch of bowel and you use something like the appendix to bring up to the skin and you pass a catheter through the skin down to empty this every three, four hours or so. Um, I'll just That's one gory slide. Sorry, I should have told you. There is a gory slide coming up. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. It's one of the only ones. But that's, that's the appendix. The appendix is quite a good thing to use the tube. And what you do is get a piece of bowel and you make a pouch out of it, like that. And you get the append you put the ureters from the kidney in the back of it, so that are at the top of the screen. And you bring the appendix, bury it in the pouch, like that, and bring it, I'll miss that one, bring it up to the skin, either the, at the umbilical, like the belly button, or in the right lower abdomen. And that uh, is the way that you get into the Blood, in fact, the internal bladder, and then you pass a tube in to empty it every three or four hours. And this is one way of doing this. It's, it's something that you have to be pretty motivated to use because you've basically got this for the rest of your days to catheterize yourself every three or four hours and probably during the night. Um, again, for people who can't have a stoma or don't want a stoma and can't have that bladder reconstructed. Uh, you know, I've done about 700 cystectomies in my life, 800 maybe. Uh, I've done this about 40 times. So it's, you can see that the, it's a relatively low percentage of people would go for that form of diversion. But it is available to people who, again, don't want a stoma, uh, uh, an either conduit stoma, and can't have a reconstruction for some reason. Um, 
the problems are that that narrowing between the skin and the appendix can close off and you, keep, you need to keep stretching it. You can form stones in it. As with any diversion, you get infection and produce mucus. Uh, and all these things can mean that probably somewhere around four in 10 people with these form of diversions do have to have some further procedure uh, during the years following the initial operation. Often far more minor than the original one, but uh, still further interventions. More commonly used, if you're not going to, if you if you've still got a urethra that you can pass urine through, in a man that means, you know, you can take the prostate and bladder out and leave the urethra present, and in a woman you take the bladder out and make the uterus and leave the front of the vagina and just the urethra present. So you've got something you can sew a pouch onto. You can make a pouch of bladder. Initially we used colon. Last 20 years or so, it's almost always been small bowel where you actually get some small bowel, make a pouch and you sew it back onto the individual's own urethra. And hopefully they have control and can pee something like the normal way. That's a neobladder, orthotopic bladder, neobladder, whatever you want to call it, ideal bladder. And this is basically a diagram of what you do. You can take a piece of, a long 55 centimeter piece of small bowel out of the normal circulation, sew the bowel back together again. Sorry, I can't make my point to work. You uh, produce a pipe at one end to put the kidneys and the tubes into, the ureters, and you form a pouch at the lower end, like that, like that. So you've got a, the kidneys draining into the top, you've got a pouch at the bottom, and you sew it onto the urethra, and that applies the same way whether it's a male or female urethra, and end up with a pouch, a bladder, that looks something like your own bladder, although it is bowel and not bladder, so it will function differently, uh, and it will store urine until you can um, you can uh, pass it out uh, the uh, appropriate way. Interruption, just everyone, if you do have questions, remember to type them in the chat function below. Please. Thank you, continue. Thank you. So does everybody understand what that is? That's, that's trying to form something similar to your own bladder. There are different ways of doing it. There are Z bladders, W bladders, uh, ideal conduits, uh, there's allial pouches like this. This is the one the commonest form is trying to approximate something to your own bladder uh, and to try and stop the urine passing back up in the kidney and to, and to stop urine leaking out at inappropriate times. Uh, it, it's a good operation. It's not your own bladder though, so it's, it's not going to ever perform just the same way as your own bladder did. And some of the problems with it can be it's bowel. All intestine produces mucus. Uh, most people deal with this. It's it's like white streaks in the urine. It very, very, very occasionally can cause blockages, uh, but that's unusual. You, um, you, you, it's usually just an observation. Uh, urine leakage, though, somewhere, depending on which series you read, somewhere between 10 and 40% of people can have urine leakage at inappropriate times. Rarely is it, is it complete incontinence, but uh, it's a, in my series, it was 10% in the daytime. There's another group of a similar size that actually completely fine in the daytime, but as soon as they go to sleep, they seem to leak urine. Some loss of central brain control over mean, means that they leak urine when they're asleep, but they're completely fine in the daytime. So um, I, I, urinary leakage is uh, a problem for some people. I must say when we looked at the quality of life in um, people back in Bristol, in like the first couple of hundred of these, um, not a single person with leakage said they prefer to go over to a stoma, however, because they would deal with it in one way or the other. What about urinary retention? Some surgeons teach all their patients to self-catheterize. Uh, I don't because it's quite rare to actually not be able to empty and get retention. Uh, usually, if, if that is the case, there's some probably scarring or narrowing of the exits. So uh, it's probably something like one in 20 actually need self-catheterization. Um, but uh, some series, it's higher than that. Uh, so routine self-catheterization, it's questionable whether you need to be able to do it. In fact, female neobladders seem to function better than male ones if, um, if they're done correctly. Uh, so I would not personally teach everybody to self-catheterize, but there will be a very small number who do. Uh, stones can form in any pouch. Uh, in fact, again, pretty rare in ideal neobladders. Um, you have to watch the kidneys, the upper tracts, because with any form of diversion, this includes ideal conduit, there can, over the years, be some deterioration of kidney function and occasionally they start to dilate and not necessarily always because of blockage. It can be reflux of urine going back up into the kidney, urine 
squirting back up rather than staying where it should be. So watching the kidneys in the long term with blood tests and maybe ultrasound scans is necessary. I put malignancy at the end because people are worried about the possibility of cancers forming in these pouches. There are, like about in the UK, where there are thousands of these operations, and I think there have been somewhere between three and four cases ever presented, and it's, the risk is quite tiny. It's certainly far, far lower than having a bladder with cancer in it be your own, which could be a, is a risk to your future. So the risk of malignancy of other secondary cancers, new cancer that are different to your original one forming, in one of these pouches is not zero, but it is quite tiny. Um, professor, can I ask you a question yep. on neobladders yep. uh, from one of the participants? Um, uh, there's a, a participant who's recently had more CIS on their, uh, at their TRBTs, carcinoma in situ. What are your thoughts on the presence of CIS and having a neobladder? Um, well, it's, it's, it's worrying um, because CIS, you know, bladder cancer is a field effect, which means it can affect the whole of the bladder and down the urethra and indeed up into the kidneys some, in some rarer cases. Um, I think you've got, well, it depends where the CIS is, if it's confined to the bladder um, and you're taking the bladder out because of uncontrolled CIS, I, uh, I, I would still consider a neobladder if it was away from the by the neck, you know, you're going to take the prostate out, and it's not, it's never been shown to be in the prostate, for example. Fem female. Uh, female, well, it's not going to be in the prostate then, is it? Um, so in the, uh, in the, if it's the way, and the, the female urethra, is might, you know, as you know, is, uh, is a different form of lining when it gets down into the main urethra. So again, if it's well away from the by the neck, uh, I would have the conversation with the individual. The risk of re recurrence of cancer at the joint is, is higher, but if it's, if it's confined to the bladder away from the by the neck, I would consider it. With, but you'd have to have a discussion with a person about the additional risks. The other thing you have to watch, of course, is the lower ureters. Um, they may also be uh, You might want to... So maybe you can check those for the presence of CIS too. So you would want to avoid it, the neobladder, if there's extensive CIS near the edges, but I would still consider it in selected cases. Uh, sorry, just if if they, we have some male participants as well that might have CIS, well, how would it be different for them? Well, well, same thing. I mean, if it's CIS going towards the blood and neck, I'd watch towards the blood and some biopsy of the prostatic urethra to make sure that wasn't affected by it. If the prostate was clear, I would still consider it, yes. Okay. Um, are, you, are you still going on to ileal conduit, or should I ask you a question now about ileal conduit? Yeah, well, I'll pass the ileal conduit, and I'm talking to Carol. Um, the question was, in the, are the original blood vessels retained or stay, do they stay connected to the small intestine for the ileal conduit? Uh, we've got, you've got to get a blood supply to the, to the ileal segment, so yes, it's the original blood supply. If you divide the blood supply, it'll die, basically. So, so you, 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 it, wouldn't, well, it wouldn't be there to, to, to become ischemic. So yes, it's the original blood supply to that piece of bowel. Um, can we take it a step back? Someone's asking, what is CIS? Sorry? What is CIS? What is CIS? Carcinoma mm. in situ, it's where you get cancerous malignant cells forming in the lining of the bladder, but it's just in the lining. They've got cancerous appearance, but they haven't formed, I guess they haven't formed a proper cancer. They haven't started to grow or into something that looks like a tumor or invade into the bladder wall. It almost looks like red, redness in the bladder. And that can be one of the problems, in, in, you know, inflammation, infection can have the same appearance sometimes. Uh, so you have to be careful with your interpretation of what it is. Carcinoma in situ is basically flat cancerous cells that are just in the lining of the bladder that haven't really formed into a lump or a tumour as yet. Does that sound like a reasonable explanation, Kelly? Yeah, and of course it's also considered high risk. Well, it's possible that the CIS through to high-grade cancer pathway is the one that's the dangerous one, that more papular, you know, warty-like, low-grade tumours that just grow slowly are the less risky ones, but the, the ones that cast over inside you probably goes on to the more high-grade cancers and eventually the aggressive, you know, invasive cancer that might spread. Uh, one other question. How common are kidney stones after ileal conduit? Um, they're commoner than without one. I mean, obviously, having a diversion does increase some people's risk of getting kidney stones. Yes, um, I personally recommend the, uh, you know, the long-term yearly ultrasound and any 
dilatation of the upper tracts or stone should start to show on, on the, those scans. You can continue. That's all for now. Uh, I'll just pull that in. So this is my first 600 rod cystectomies up to about 2010. Just to show that any surgeon should actually get complications now. This, is good. this doesn't look great, um, but in fact it's not as bad as it looks. It's just that when you go into a cystectomy, uh, there are some long-term consequences. You know, something like 18% of people have late complications. Now, in the end, most of them are things like getting urine infections, which are uh, hernias or anastomas. Um, a cystocele means, you know, in a woman getting a, a bit of prolapse due to the surgery, uh, some bit of narrowing of the bladder neck. So the vast majority of these aren't, you know, Think things requiring major surgery, but um, I mean, you know, I've had a colleague, a friend back in the UK, said once you've done a couple of hundred operations, a complicated operation, you maybe should stop for a while and deal with the long term consequences. So, the reason I put this up is to say the ideal situation is to get a relationship with your surgical and medical team because if you get to know them and they know when things may need dealing with, often things can be dealt with in a rather simple way rather than letting things build up. So it is a sort of a, in some ways, uh, one of the reasons uh, I rather miss my job in Bristol is you uh, do develop long-term relationships with patients, you, uh, you, you, you avoid problems, you get around them, you work together on it, so that's the best way of doing it personally. So it looks like a lot of people get problems. In fact, most of them, you know, things you deal with just along, along a journey and people come along with a little bit of wound problems, a bit of a hernia uh, that doesn't always need treating slight problems, peeing, an infection, you, you get through them. So, but it's better if you do that with somebody you, or a team you know. And the team just isn't just the surgeon. It should be the surgeon, their team, the, uh, uh, the nurses who deal with stomas, the nurses who deal with reconstructions, the cancer nurses, all those people are important parts of the team. So that's not supposed to say that there are a lot of problems. Well, the, the, just to say that the, if you deal with these issues early on, they're less likely to cause big problems and therefore it's best to uh, you know, work alongside your uh, patient or to make sure you keep on top of them all. So the stent is just basically a plastic tube that fits between across the joint between either the conduit or the near bladder and the ureter. It acts as a form of splint. I mean, basically the urine passes down or around it and uh, allows healing between the ureter and the bit of bowel that's being used. Um, personally, I'd leave them in for about seven to eight days some people leave them a bit less some people leave them a lot longer surgery is not a precise uh, um, medicine is not a precise uh, an absolute uh, speciality most people would leave them in for a, a week to ten days uh, but usually they they're just pulled out through the bladder or, or the skin depending on where, where, where they're brought out so it's essentially working as some sort of splint a couple of quick things i mean obviously you can reduce trauma uh, which has been understood more over the last 10 years you maybe reduce side effects. Basically, this is the prostate. So these are the nerves and blood vessels around it. The nerves that go down in a man around the prostate go down the penis. They aid um, sexual function, but they probably also play a part in controlling the waterworks. These three slides I'll just flick through, two slides, just basically say if you do save a man's nerves around the prostate, you're more likely to get both control of the waterworks more quickly during the day and night time. So, more precise surgery probably does result in better urinary control if you've got a near bladder. Not perfect, but probably better. And the same happens in women. I mean, uh, women, women have near bladders too. I actually think they do better with them than men in some ways. Uh, and you can, in sometimes in younger women, spare the ovaries if they're premenopause. Um, but also you can spare the nerves too, because women have the same issue. If this is a cross section with the bladder in the front and the vagina in the middle and the rectum at the back, there are nerves that lie there, just like men, that are responsible for both uh, urethral and sexual uh, function, which can be preserved if it's understood where they are. So probably should be some discussion with your surgeon about uh, whether it's possible to preserve function in that way, if, 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 if it is and uh, if, it would, if it is still necessary. Get that. Oops, sorry, that was a gory one. Am I supposed to show a, a, a robot operation or not? Um, you can, if, if people don't want to see it, then we can just tell them to close their eyes now and we'll tell them when to look again. Um, so it's inside the abdomen and it's what would be happening with your surgery, yeah?
I mean, so, open, we, open surgery make a large incision. Well, not hopefully not so large an incision, usually belly button down. But well, the only reason I'm showing the robot operation, I'll come on to briefly at the end, is that the idea of robotic surgery is not only it's less invasive, but it's more precise. And this is the sort of picture you get with robot surgery. This is inside a lady's pelvis having a bladder out. And that, now, those instruments are about half a centimetre across. So normally you would be doing this with a big pair of scissors down a deep dark hole and that's actually taking the bladder off the front of the vagina. The white thing you can see there is a swab in the vagina. So uh, the, the ovary uh, is off on the left side of the screen. Uh, this is more precise, more accurate surgery and it looks a bit bloody but in fact there's not that much blood loss there. In a standard cystectomy in the past you'd be losing a lot of blood uh, and this is relatively bloodless and very precise. That's This is a robot operation. So you can see how it's um, right up against what you're operating on. This would be in the distance down in the pelvis if you do an open operation. So uh, we'll, we'll go on to other reasons of robotics, but one of them is for the surgeon. It's just so much 3D vision, precise, right up close. You get a better view of what you're doing, basically. Um, okay. So a couple of things about surgical challenges. Well, you know, this is major surgery. You've got to get people through major cancer surgery, try and cure them with a good ch chance of getting back to normal function or as close to as you can. Um, we developed an approach 15 years ago which's called en enhanced recovery, which means that rather than just letting people get over the operation and get them when they feel ready for it, getting back to eating and drinking, the problem with major surgery, if you don't get ahead of yourself on it, the body starts to use up its own reserves. So you stay in bed for a while, your bowels aren't working, you start to use up your own protein reserves, you start losing weight, you lose your proteins, and it becomes a, a, a recovery problem. Even if you then get home in 10 days time, you find that the body takes months to recover from that insult. So enhanced recovery is trying to avoid some of those problems to make not only the time in hospital, uh, better if possible and quicker, but also that recovery period at home should be smoother and better. We, got, we did some work 25 years ago and you know in the old days, patients often said it took a year or more to get physically anywhere back near to normal, um, sometimes even longer than that. Um, and the idea of enhanced recovery is to try and get people to avoid that huge weight loss that some get, for example, um, and protein loss that causes that needs to be um, got over. Um, so that's called enhanced recovery. Just some quick points. If you uh, get better information, you, you, you sort out nutrition, you stop smoking, you get less narcotic anesthetic, you keep patients warm, you stop the, you get them eating earlier on, you've got to get better quicker. If somebody's cold, scared, they're nauseous, they've lost their proteins, they're not sleeping well, they've got too many drains and tubes hanging out, well you're going to take longer to get over the operation. So the idea of enhanced recovery is to do more of the right side and less of the left. And that should be a part of any major centre doing cystectomies I believe now. Um, this is just to say that you've got to really accept that Recovery starts right from the beginning, from the moment you're referred from your GP and then into hospital and you're diagnosed with cancer right through the operation. To follow up is a process that needs to be controlled and managed. Um, and too often in the past, people were just told they got cancer, coming to hospital with an operation, then sent home and, and you know, fend for yourself. And that's probably still happens quite a lot, unfortunately. But uh, we need a, a better care system to uh, take people from the diagnosis right through to recovery and back to uh, back to their loved ones and life, hopefully. And that's done by, it's a complicated process, this is the whole process, every stage there's things you can do to try and make recovery better. During the surgery, minimally invasive surgery, trying to avoid tubes down the nose, less narcotic an uh, an uh, analgesia afterwards, uh, earlier feeding, all sorts of things that can be done doesn't mean to say you're going to avoid problems in every case, but hopefully you can speed recovery and, uh, and reduce the risk of complications and problems. Because if you don't do these things, people do take a long time to recover from this, this, this sort of major surgery. And you often find that means they come back to the hospital with problems after a few weeks. There's a you know, need for tidying up issues. And uh, enhanced recovery just means thinking about the problem right from the beginning, right to 
recovery and not just thinking about the operation. And it needs a big team of people. I've noticed I put the nurse specialist at the top, stoma nurses, cancer nurses, physio, occupational therapists, the anesthesia and pain management people, people who pre-assess you and make sure that all your medical problems, you know, a lot of cancer patients traditionally have a lot of other disease. They often in the past have been male smokers. They, they have diabetes and lung and heart problems. They need to be sorted out before the operation, not afterwards. Uh, in the end, the surgical team are in there too, but they, they, they should be directing this, but come in and do the operation, look after the patient. But uh, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to go on around that, including back into, into the community, into primary care, and groups like this that support uh, where people support each other through the process. That's the why these groups are so important to uh, inform, find out where problems are, be open about them. It's uh, you know things are going to happen, and it's this way. It's 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 it's, it's, it's uh, negotiating and um, path pathways through them. So that's just to say, if you want a proper dance recovery team, you are supported by a lot of people. It's not just the uh, the uh, surgeon uh, with his. Um, uh, robot or scalpel it's a whole team of people around you um just a couple of things i was going to mention um this really was to also say that uh, i'm a big believer in centralizing care for complex things which australia unfortunately doesn't do very well uh, it was forced in the uh, uk about 20 years ago but what it, basically what it says is that for complicated operations you you get better results in bigger centers that do a lot and it's not just individual surgeons being uh, brilliant at it. It's, like, it's the fact you've got a whole team around you. Uh, there are about 200 cystectomies done a year in New South Wales, and there are 44 different hospitals doing them, which means that a lot of people only do one or two a year, which uh, the unit I came from in the UK, we did 125 <coughs> a year, which is almost as much as two thirds of New South Wales. Um, it just seems to me that you, 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 you cannot, uh, uh, you've got a lot of good surgeons around, but it's not just about the surgeon. It's about getting the whole team together to actually deal with the consequences of major surgery. So uh, centralising care, better analgesia and anaesthesia, <coughs> less, less invasive surgery, um, new technology, less blood loss, transfusion rates for cystectomy used to be getting up to 60 to 80 percent, and now should be hopefully well, uh, getting, you know, it's probably the 5 to 10 percent level in most big centres now. Remembering that some people are anemic before they start the operation, so they need topping up. So there have been a lot of new developments. I'll put this as the last slide. Um, this is a robot. Uh, sorry about the uh, thing that was this patient gave consent, by the way, to show this. Um, this basically is a machine that comes in and operates through uh, five puncture wounds in the abdomen rather than one big incision. Normally you have an incision from belly button at least down to the lower abdomen. Uh, uh, that often is the bit of the operation that slows people down in recovery. You have more pain, pain relief needed, you have drains and things in. The advantage of the robot is that you actually make less, you're less it's less invasive. Uh, it's difficult to actually prove that it's a better operation than an open operation, but my belief is that if you can reduce the size of your incision, you can reduce the amount of time that people's insides are open to the rest of the world, then recovery is going to be quicker. So this is the DaVinci robot. There are new versions appearing now. One problem with this machine it costs $4 million uh, and the disposal reach case for about $4,000. So you have to do a lot to make it cost effective. Um, if you, um, uh, there are competing technologies appearing. There's a British setup that's just, we're just getting at Macquarie. We've got two of these DaVinci's and we're getting the Versius system as well. There are other machines appearing which will hopefully bring the price down. It will just become a surgical tool like anything else. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, um, it's, a, it's a tool that, it, that allows us to do the operation in a less invasive way, a more precise way, uh, if I must say, a more expensive way for the actual day of the operation. But if you get people out of hospital with less complications and more quickly, there's money saved in another direction. So personally, whether you have it done robotically or some other less invasive way, it, it's, it will, I believe, aid recovery. Uh, and some people take the bladder and prostate out robotically and maybe make a small incision to, to make the eye of the conduit or make the new bladder. But all the general concept is you try and reduce the amount of trauma you put the individual through 
And logically, of course, that would suggest you're going to help them recover more quickly. So I think I'm going to stop there, but that's just a, the bit about robotics. You've seen a video of it. It's, the video is not actually that important. It's the fact you're actually less invasive about and more precise about doing the operation.